A hare's life depends on a quick getaway. Its speed, its ability to elude its pursuers. Its hind legs are nearly twice as long as its forelegs, and it can make sudden kangaroo leaps and twists. and incidentally run uphill just as fast, if not faster, than it can run on the flat. A hare can take a six-foot fence in its stride, make a long jump of 18 feet or more to foil scent, and one's been seen jumping Beecher's Brook on the Grand National Course. At its fastest, it can probably touch 45 miles an hour. Hares are members of the order Rodentia, which includes rats, mice, voles, squirrels, guinea pigs, and rabbits. Rabbits are, in fact, the only other animals which can be confused with hares. The main differences, of course, are that the rabbit is smaller and hasn't got the black behind the tips of its ears that the hare has. This is a rabbit, and here are the black ear tips of a hare. Its march on this East Dorset farm, and the hares are especially active. They're as mad as March hares, in fact. There's a lot of chasing about, one buck seeing off another, or scuffles between buck and doe. But this activity is mainly confined to the early morning. After about nine o'clock in the morning, the hares, which were comparatively easy to see from a distance, begin to settle down. And whether they're in the arable fields or whether on the short grass, they sort of begin to merge with the landscape and they're lost. Well, now there's the problem. I'm standing at this moment probably within a few hundred yards of a dozen hares, and yet I can't see one of them. How can one first of all find them, and then, once you've found them, how can one get near to them without alarming them? Well, the man who seems to have found the answer to this problem is Eric Ashby. He's uh, been filming hares down on this Dorsetshire farm for the best part of a year. And maybe you can remember his very beautiful close-up pictures of badgers and foxes in the New Forest. Well, I've come down here on this very windy March day in order to see how Eric tackles hares. And of course, one of his main problems is the noise of the camera motor. And so he has to have this blimp round the camera, which he pads up with all kinds of uh, uh, sound insulating material in order to deaden the noise of the camera itself. Well, then it's all shut up and then you're ready to go. And are you all ready now, Eric? Yes, I'm ready. Well, then off you go, and I hope you manage to get close to him. Right, I should explain what Eric's trying to do. Uh, he knows there are some hares up in the field there, and he's checked the wind to make certain that none of his scent blows across them. And then he's going up by that wood there in order to get the trees behind him uh, so that they'll give him some sort of a background against which the hares won't see him so well. And then he'll go very directly towards them without moving sideways at all, just absolutely straight and terribly slowly towards them. Well, now, whilst Eric's out there in the field stalking, I thought we might have a closer look at the animal he's trying to photograph. Now, if you don't happen to live in a part of the country where there are a lot of deer and you're not prepared to sit up and watch for badgers or foxes, the hare is probably the largest native mammal that you're likely to see. The brown hare is the one you get round here. In fact, you get it all over Great Britain, except perhaps in the mountains of Wales and Scotland. By the way, these are paintings by Thorburn. Up in the mountains, you get the blue hare which turns white in winter. It has shorter ears and tail than the brown hare, but in summer it's dark coloured and not really blue, just a, a greyer kind of brown. The Irish hare in the background in this picture is closely related to the Scottish one, and it also changes colour to some extent in the winter, but not as much as the Scottish race does. 
The blue hairs are never wholly white like the true Arctic hare. These were photographed in Greenland, and although there's no snow on the ground just here, it's easy to see the survival value of having a white coat in, in that part of the world. Elegant creatures, aren't they? And rather tame by nature. Occasionally you see what appears to be a white hare in England. In this case, it's not a stray mountain hare come down into the lowlands, but a very pale variety, a freak of the ordinary brown hare. Incidentally, this one seems to be a buck by its behaviour. It's showing a certain amount of interest in the normal coloured doe over there. When spring comes, the males, which are sometimes called jacks, go in for strange antics, taking sudden vertical leaps, perpetually half circling each other and then dashing suddenly off stopping and starting, apparently without rhyme or reason. Just look at this. <laughs> Mad, isn't it? Mad enough for the proverbial association of madness with March and with hares and with Alice in Wonderland. But there are plenty of references to hares long before Lewis Carroll invited one to the Mad Tea Party. Uh, Caesar, for example, records that the Britons wouldn't eat hares, although they were considered a delicacy by the Romans. Well, then, I think the hare has been a sort of magical creature in Britain uh, for a very long time. For instance, there are lots of records of uh, witches which are, have been able to turn themselves into the form of a hare. And there's a the very strange legend which occurs in a lot of different English counties of the hare that was shot in the heart by a silver bullet. And then the witch was found in bed, also shot through the heart with a silver bullet. And then there's the very strange superstition that uh, if an expectant mother should meet a hare, then the child might be born with a hare lip. And you get this not only in Britain, but also in a lot of continental countries. Well, I wonder how Eric's getting on out there with his hares. If he's managed to find them, he should be working into quite a close position by now. I mean, he has tremendous patience. Of course, this is the secret of Eric's success. Tremendous patience. But you know, there are places where hares get unusually, almost unnaturally tame. This is the Royal Air Force Station at Aldergrove, near Belfast. And here one can see Irish hares. Isn't that an astonishing sight? Here at Aldergrove, and at the Civil Airport at Nuts Corner, a few miles away, it's possible to see packs of over a hundred, and sometimes as many as three hundred, Irish hares together. Amazing. These are mountain hares with shorter ears than the brown hare, and they seem to appreciate the protection and seclusion of the airport, where, of course, there's no shooting or coursing allowed. During the day, they sit around completely unperturbed by the screaming of jets landing and taking off just a few yards away from them. These were filmed just before the breeding activity really began. Many of them still have their party-coloured winter coats. There's an especially light-coloured one. And look what huge snowshoes they have at that time of the year. In the winter, they grow long, crisp hair on their hind feet, all the better for moving about on the soft snow. Although they don't take any notice of the plains, these Irish hares move away when people get too close. They let them get within about 70 yards or so, but if they come any closer, then the hares move off in a mob.
but they never go very far and they usually swing round in a 200 yard circle and come back surprisingly quickly to the first spot. You just can't seem to drive them away altogether. Just like a herd of deer or antelopes, aren't they? That is extraordinary. This tendency to keep in packs seems only to happen in the Irish hare, and they're said to do the same sort of thing sometimes on the slopes of the mountains. These Irish hares and the Scottish ones are both descended from a, an ancestor, now extinct, which was the common hare of Britain in the Pleistocene era 10 million years ago. The brown hare of England was a comparatively late arrival from the continent, crossing while the English Channel was still land, but after Ireland had been cut off. And so the Irish hares have still got Ireland to themselves, except for a few brown hares which have been introduced by man. Back here in England, the brown hare crowded out the blue hare and forced it up into the mountains. In this open Dorset land, they never mass like the Irish hares and they're much wilder and of course much less easy to photograph. Although they're often seen in pairs, mating is promiscuous. That is, one buck may mate with several does and one doe may be covered by a number of bucks. While he's near a doe, a buck will often have to break away and chase off another one. There's another buck being seen off. He appears to be washing his hands of the whole affair. Incidentally, it's very difficult to tell the buck from the doe at first, but generally the buck is slightly larger and a more coarsely built animal than the doe. Sometimes the intruder doesn't run away and then the fur begins to fly. Having chased all intruders away, the buck settles down quietly for the day with his doe. When the hares are lying up for the day, Eric has a chance to show how close he can get by the method we saw earlier. He's right out in the open, no cover at all except perhaps a background of trees to break his outline. Inch by inch he creeps in. The hare can see him, but not very clearly because they haven't got very good eyesight. And as far as this one's concerned, Eric might be a grazing cow. Now just watch how close he gets. And don't forget this is a completely wild animal. And even a little closer still. Isn't that a superb picture? Suddenly he can't stand it any longer and away he goes. Eric hasn't any problem in getting close to the leverets, the young hares. The problem there has been finding them. They're generally so very well camouflaged. After giving birth, the doe, during the night, carries each of her leverets in her mouth to a separate form, just as a cat carries her kittens. By dispersing them, of course, she gives them a greater chance of survival. There are between one and four leverets in a litter and they are born fully furred and with their eyes open. And that's another difference between hares and rabbits whose young are born naked and blind in a burrow. But young leverets are very much on their own from the start, except at night when the doe comes round to suckle them. 
There are several litters in a season, and in fact, leverets have been recorded in every month of the year. As the spring turns into summer, the grass and young corn grows, giving much greater cover for the hares. Quite a relief, no doubt, to our friend the freak white buck. The leverets, too, have more cover in their forms. This one's five or six weeks old. By mid-June, the corn has grown up so much that the hares can only occasionally be seen. Every now and again a pair of ears gives them away. In fact, it must be quite a paradise for them, until harvest time comes. The hares seem to a large extent confused by the whole operation, and one can't blame them really when this rumbling juggernaut goes round and round them. Some emerge and don't know which way to turn. This one's actually running towards the machine. Eventually the adults at least have a sense to run away, but the leveret's instinct is to sit close and not to move. And in this case it's the wrong thing to do. The machine just flattens it. Hares will eat almost any fresh green stuff. Like all grazing animals, they have to feed pretty continuously, but especially at night. And then during the day, they retire to their form, and here an interesting thing happens. It's called refection. They make some special droppings, which they then eat again directly from the vent. What happens is that, in the first place, the food is eaten very rapidly, while it's safe, say at night. And then it passes through the hair, being only partially digested and then it's re-eaten and properly digested when the hare's at rest in the form. Now here's our light-coloured friend again, and now watch him actually starting to eat his own droppings. Not to our way of thinking a very attractive habit perhaps, but it's really just another method of chewing the cud. Just like a cow. With the coming of winter, the hares have to face some hard conditions up on these bleak Dorset hills, and particularly last winter. When the snow was lying thick, you could see their prints leading to and from the forms that they'd been using during the day. Of course, at close range, in deep snow, they're pretty conspicuous. You can imagine what an advantage the mountain hares would have in this sort of weather with their white winter coats. This one was helped by the wind blowing snow over its back. Well, the snow was so deep that, uh, of course, the hares couldn't get at their normal food, which is grass and clover and young corn and this kind of thing. And so they came in here into this wood. They got over a fence here, probably over on the snow drifts that were against it. And they started to eat some of the little trees. And they're growing a lot of little trees down here. For instance, a little beech tree here. And, uh, well, they've eaten all the leading shoots off it. Uh, it may well be that, um, the tree itself will survive, but in fact, uh, it'll probably not make such good timber, and so this is quite considerable damage. Of course, this um, adaptability of diet uh, is very useful to hares in, in cold weather, and Eric reckons that uh, because of it, his hares around here got through the winter extraordinarily well. But you know, when animals get destructive, man's inclined to get tough and uh, they feel, you know, that uh, something's got to be done about it. And so it was one misty morning last February that a line of guns stretched along the edge of this wood here. And from away across the other side of the field, out of the mist, came a line of beaters. There's usually one big shoot held on this land every year. 
The hares have been doing well here, especially since the rabbit population took such a plunge from myxomatosis, and so the farmers got to make sure that their numbers don't get out of control. In spite of the fact that 400 may be shot in one day, they always seem to build up again within a few months. The twisting and the speed of the hares aren't very much use to them against a whole line of guns, but somehow enough get away at the sides or by sitting tight in their forms to keep the population going. Of course, it takes a few weeks for the hares to settle down again. Normally, they don't wander about much. They stick to their own field. And they have regular paths, too, called trods. And eventually, the year's routine starts again. As we've seen, hares are very short-sighted creatures, and the bucks evidently don't find it easy to find a doe at a distance. This buck is carefully sniffing the ground, trying to pick up the scent of a doe. You see, although there's one quite a short distance away, he hasn't spotted her yet. Even when the buck has found a doe alone, there's quite a lot of ritual to go through. He has to approach pretty cautiously at first, or he'll probably get his ears boxed. And then there's a great pursuit. But finally, mating takes place and concludes with a little jump. It usually takes place several times in quick succession. Another buck and doe. The buck approaches cautiously, very cautiously. No, nope, she won't have him. But just watch him trying to wear her resistance down. And it's all part of the game. And what a game. Just watch. You know, people used to think that it was only the bucks which did the boxing, which were the really mad March hares. But now it's been realised that it's also part of the courtship routine between buck and doe. Oh well, it's a hare's life. Julia Bradbury walks in the steps of the Roman Legions next on BBC Four in the Lake District on Wainwright's Walks. That's followed by Griff Rhys-Jones on his Pembrokeshire farm. <laughs> 